Hello, hello. So today I am going to be reading the player's handbook for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, to start off, I will say the reason why I'm doing this is because I actually have a learning disability and it's hard for me to read and understand or retain information. And so I've been looking all over trying to find this on audiobook so that I could read along with someone else reading. And there was actually one other YouTuber that had the read along for the Dungeons and Dragons player's manual. Same thing. But he only ever got to part one. It's been years and he never released anything else. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to be a great reader because I am dyslexic and I have a hard time reading. But maybe I'm still better at reading than somebody else out there who this could help. Or maybe you want to listen to something in the bathtub or while you're doing something else and try to either learn or refresh the information that you have. I'm going to be breaking this down into several, hopefully, smaller videos on different things just going through the books. I will try to stay word for word exactly what it is. Sometimes I just auto switch things, so hopefully you will bear with me. Stay. Um, I will try to give credit where it's due in the front here. I'm not going to read through everything. Uh, obviously, Dungeons and Dragons is produced by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, it was released via Hasbro. And on the fine front cover, this is a scene illustrated by Tyler Jacobson, the fire giant, King Snurre. Sorry, I can't pronounce things well. Suffering no fools to live, calls his hellhounds to join him in confronting the unwelcomed guests in his home. Yes. Um, the... Player's Handbook lead was Jeremy Crawford. The rules development was Rodney Thompson and Peter Lee. The actual writing was by James Watt, Robert Schwalp, and Bruce Cordell. Editing by Michelle Carter, Chris Sims, Scott Fitzgerald Gray, and Christopher Perkins. The producer was Greg Filson. Obviously, if you're reading along with this, you have the book. Also, Wizards of the Coast. If you're listening to this, make an audiobook, please. People deserve it. So I'm going to start right out with the preface. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, in a realm called the Midwestern United States, specifically the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin, a group of friends gathered together to forever alter the history of gaming. It wasn't their intent to do so. They were merely tired of reading tales about worlds of magic, monsters, and adventure. They wanted to play in those worlds rather than observe them. They, blah, blah, that they went on to invent Dungeons and Dragons and thereby ignite a revolution in gaming that continues to this day speaks to two things. First, it speaks to their ingenuity and genius and figuring out that the games were a perfect way to explore worlds that they could not otherwise visit. Almost every modern game, whether played on a digital device, a tabletop, or a tabletop, owes some debt to D&D. &D. Second, it is a testament to the inherent appeal of the game that they created. Dungeons and Dragons sparked a thriving global phenomenon. It is the first role-playing game, and it remains one of the best of its breed. To play D&D, &D and to play it well, you don't need to read all the rules, memorize every detail of the game, or master the fine art of rolling funny looking dice. None of those things have any bearing on what's best about the game. What you need are two things. First, being friends with whom you can share the game. Playing games with your friends is a lot of fun, but D&D &D does something more than entertain. Playing D&D is an exercise in collaborative creation. You and your friends create epic stories filled with tension and memorable drama. You create silly in-jokes that you will laugh years later. 
The dice will be cruel to you, but you will soldier on. Your collective creativity will build stories that will you will tell again and again, ranging from the utterly absurd to the stuff of legends. If you don't have friends interested in playing, don't worry. There is a special alchemy that takes place around a D&D table that nothing else can match. Play the game with someone enough, and the two of you are likely to end up as friends. It's a cool side effect of the game. Your next gaming group is as close as the nearest game store, online forum, or gaming convention. The second thing you need is a lively imagination, or, more importantly, the willingness to use whatever imagination you have. You don't need to be a master storyteller or a brilliant artist. You just need to aspire to create, to have the courage of someone who is willing to build something and share it with others. Luckily, just as D&D can strengthen your friendships, it can help you build the confidence to create and share. D&D is a game that teaches you to look for the clever solution and share the sudden idea that can overcome a problem and push yourself to imagine what could be rather than simply accept what it is. The first characters and adventures you create will probably be a collection of cliches. <laughs> That's true of everyone, from the greatest dungeon masters in history on down. Accept this reality and move on to create the second character or adventure, which will be better, and the third, which will be better still. Repeat that over the course of time, and soon you will be able to create anything, from a character's background story to an epic world of fantasy adventure. Once you have that skill, it's yours forever. Countless writers, authors, artists, and other creators can trace their beginnings to a few pages of D&D &D notes, a handful of dice, and a kitchen table. Above all else, D&D &D is yours. The friendships you make around the table will be unique to you. The adventures you embark on, the characters you create, the memories you make, these will be yours. D&D &D is your personal corner of the universe, a place where you have free reign to do as you wish. Now go forth, read the rules of the game, and the story of its worlds, but always remember that you are the one who brings them to life. They are nothing without the spark of life that you give them. Mike Merles, May 2014. And that was the preface, which I don't actually think is it. Now the next, we have the introduction page. And I will be reading it straight down, then reading the excerpt, then the actual thing, then the excerpt, which may or may not be confusing, and if it doesn't work this time, I'll probably change how I read it through the book. Bear with me. Introduction. The Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game is about storytelling in worlds of swords and sorcery. It shares elements with childhood games of make-believe, like those games, D&D is driven by imagination. It's about picturing the towering castle beneath the stormy night sky and imagining how a fantasy adventurer might react to the challenges that scene pre bleh, presents. Dungeon Master, Dia. After passing through the craggy peaks, the road takes a sudden turn to the east and Castle Ravenloft towers before you. Crumbling towers of a stone keep a silent watch over the approach. They look like abandoned guardhouses. Beyond these, a wide chasm gapes, disappearing into the deep fog below. A lowered drawbridge spans the chasm, leading to an arched entrance to the castle courtyard. The chains of the drawbridge creak in the wind, their rust-eaten iron straining with the weight. From atop the high, strong walls, stone gargoyles stare at you from hollow sockets and grin hideously. A rotten, rotting wooden porculus, green with growth, hangs in the entry tunnel. Beyond this, the main doors of Castle Ravenloft stand open, a rich, warm light spilling into the courtyard. Philip, playing as Gareth. 
I want to look at the gargoyles. I have a feeling they're not just statues. Amy, playing Riva. The drawbridge looks precarious. I want to see how sturdy it is. Do I think we can cross it, or is it going to collapse under our weight? Unlike a game of make-believe, D&D gives structures to the stories, a way of determining the consequences of the, player's act of the adventurer's actions. Players roll dice to resolve whether their attacks hit or miss, or whether their adventurers can scale a cliff, roll away from a strike of a magical lightning bolt, or pull off some other dangerous task. Anything is possible, but the dice make some outcomes more probable than others. Dungeon Master. Okay, one at a time. Philip, you're looking at the gargoyles? Philip. Yeah. Is there any hint that they might be creatures and not decorations? DM. Make an intelligence check. Philip. Does my investigation skill apply? DM. Sure. Philip, rolling a d20. <laughs> Seven. DM. They look like decorations to you. And Amy? Riva is checking out the drawbridge? Go away, fly. In Dungeons & Dragons game, each player creates an adventurer, also called a character, and teams up with other adventurers, played by friends. Working together, the group might explore a dark dungeon, a ruined city, a haunted castle, a lost temple deep within a jungle, or a lava-filled cavern beneath a mysterious mountain. The adventurers can solve puzzles, talk with other characters, battle fantastic monsters, and discover fabulous magic items and other treasure. One player, however, takes on the role of Dungeon Master, also known as DM. The game's lead storyteller and referee. The DM creates adventures for the characters who navigate its hazards and decide which paths to explore the DM might describe the entrance to the Castle Ravenloft, and the players decide what they want their adventurers to do. Will they walk across the dangerously weathered drawbridge, tie themselves together with rope to minimize the chance that someone will fall if the drawbridge gives way, or cast a spell to carry them over the chasm? The DM determines the results of the adventurer's actions and narrates what they experience. Because the DM can improvise to react to anything that the players attempt, D&D &D is infinitely flexible, and each adventure can be exciting and unexpected. The game has no real end. When one story or quest wraps up, another one can begin, creating an ongoing story called a campaign. Many people who play the game keep their campaigns going for months or years, meeting up with their friends every week or so to pick up the story where they left off. The adventurers grow in might as their campaign continues. Each monster defeated, each adventure completed, each treasure recovered, not only adds to the continuing story, but also earns the adventurers new capabilities. This increases in power, this increase in power, is reflected by the adventurer's level. There's no winning and losing in the Dungeons & Dragons game, at least not in those terms that are usually understood. Together, the DM and the players create an exciting story of bold adventurers who confront deadly perils, something an adventurer might come... Sometimes an adventurer might come to a grisly end, torn apart by ferocious monsters or done in by the nefarious villain. Even so, the other adventurers can search for magic, <laughs> powerful magic to revive their fallen comrade, or the player might choose to create a new character to carry on. The group might fail to complete an adventure successfully, but if everyone had a good time and created a memorable story, then they all win. Worlds of Adventure the many worlds of Dungeons & Dragons game are places of magic and monsters, of brave warriors and spectacular adventures. They begin with the foundation of medieval fantasy and then add creatures, places, and magic that make these worlds unique. The world of Dungeons & Dragons game exists within a vast cosmos called the multiverse. 
connected in strange, mysterious ways to one another and to other planes of existence, such as the elemental plane of fire and the infinite depths of the abyss. Within this multiverse are an endless variety of worlds. Many of them have been published as official settings for the D&D game. The legends of the Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, Greyhawk, Dark Sun, Mistrara, and Eberron settings are woven together in the fabric of the multiverse. Alongside these worlds are hundreds and thousands more created by generations of D&D players for their own games. And amid all of the richness of the multiverse, you might create a world of your own. All of these worlds share characteristics, but each world is set apart by its own history and cultures, distinctive monsters and races, fantastic geography, ancient dungeons and scheming villains. Some races have unusual traits in different worlds. The halflings of the Dark Sun setting, for example, are jungle-dwelling cannibals, and the elves are desert nomads. Some worlds feature races unknown in other settings, such as Eberron's warforged soldiers created and imbued with life to fight in the last war. Some worlds are dominated by one great story, like the War of the Lance that plays the center role in the Dragonlance setting. But they're all D&D worlds, and you can use the rules in this book to create a character and play in any one of them. Your DM might set the campaign on one of these worlds or on one that he or she created. Because there is so much diversity among the worlds of D&D, you should check with your DM about any house rules that will affect your play of the game. Ultimately, the DM is the authority and the campaign, the authority on the campaign and its setting, even if the setting is a published world using this book. The player's handbook is divided into three parts. Part one, also known as chapters one through six, is about creating a character, providing the rules and guidance that you will need to make the character you'll play in the game. It includes information on various races, classes, backgrounds, equipment, and other customization options that you can choose from. Many of the world rules in Part 1 rely on material in Parts 2 and 3. If you come across a game concept in Part 1 that you don't understand, consult the book's index. Part 2, also known as Chapters 7 through 9 details the rules of how to play the game, beyond the basics described in the introduction. That part covers the kinds of die rolls that you need to make in order to determine the success or failure of the tax that your character create attempts, and describes the three broad categories of an activity in the game. Exploration, interaction, and combat. Part 3, chapters 10 and 11 is all about magic. It covers the nature of magic in the D worlds of D&D, the rules for spellcasting, and a huge variety of spells available to magic using characters and monsters in the game. How to play. The play of D&D game unfolds according to this basic pattern. What? The DM describes the environment. The DM tells the players where their adventures are, adventurers are, and what's around them, presenting the basic scope of options that present themselves. How many doors lead out of a room, what's on a table, who's in the tavern, and so on. The players describe what they want to do. Sometimes one player speaks for the whole party, saying, we'll take on the east door, for example. Other times, different adventurers will do different things. One adventurer might search a treasure chest, while the second examines an esoteric symbol engraved on a wall, and a third keeps watch for monsters. The players don't need to take turns, but the DM listens to every player and decides how to resolve those actions. 
Sometimes resolving a task is easy. If an adventurer wants to walk across a room and open the door, the DM might just say that the door opens and describe what lies beyond. But the door might be locked, the floor might hide a deadly trap, or some other circumstance might make it challenging for an adventurer to complete a task. In those cases, the DM decides what happens, often relying on the roll of a die to determine the results of an action. Number three. The DM narrates the results of the adventurer's actions. Describing the results often leads to another decision point, which brings the flow of the game right back to step one. This pattern holds whether the adventurers are cautiously exploring a ruin, talking to a devious prince, or locked in mortal combat against a mighty dragon. In certain situations, particularly combat, the action is more structured and the players, and DM, do take turns choosing and resolving actions. But most of the time, play is fluid and flexible, adapting to the circumstances of the adventure. Often, the action of an ad Restart. Sorry. Often, the action of an adventure takes place in the imagination of the players and the DM, relying on the DM's verbal descriptions to set the scene. Some DMs like to use music, art, or recorded sound effects to help set the mood, and many players and DMs alike adopt different voices for the various characters, monsters, and adventurers they play in the game. Sometimes a DM might lay out a map and use tokens or miniature figures to represent each creature involved in a scene to help the players keep track of where everyone is. Personally, that's me. Game Dice. The game uses polyhedral dice with different numbers of sides. You can find dice like these in game stores and many bookstores. In these rules, the different dice are referred to by the letter D followed by the number of sides, D4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and 20. For instance, a D6 is a six-sided die, the typical cube that many games use. Percentile die, or D100, looks a little differently. You generate a number between 1 and 100 by rolling two different ten-sided dice numbered from 0 to 9. One die, designated before you roll, gives the 10 digit, and the other one gives the 1 digit. For example, if you roll a 7 and a 1, the number rolled is 71. Two zeros represents 100. Some 10-sided die are numbered in the tens, 0, 0, 10, 20, and so on. Making it easier to distinguish the tens digit from the ones digit. In this case, a roll of a 70 and a 1 is 71, and a double zero with one zero is 100. When you need to roll dice, the rules tell you how many dice to roll of a certain type, as well as what modifiers to add. For example, 3d8 plus 5 means you roll three eight-sided die, add them together, and then add five to the total. The same d notion appears in the expressions 1d3 and 1d2. To simulate the roll of a d3, roll a d6 and divide the number by two and round up. To simulate the roll of a d2, Roll any die and assign a 1 or a 2, depending on whether or not it's odds or evens. Alternatively, if the number rolled is more than half of the number of sides on the die, it's a 2. The D20. Does an adventure sword swing hurt a dragon, or just bounce off its iron hard scales? Will the ogre believe an outrageous bluff? Can a character swim across a raging river? Can a character avoid the main blast of a fireball, or does he or she take full damage from the blaze? 
In cases where the outcome of an action is uncertain, the D&D game relies on the rolls of a 20-sided die, a d20, to determine success or failure. Every character and monster in the game has capabilities defined by six ability scores. The ability scores are strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And they typically range from 3 to 18 for most adventurers. Monsters might have scores as low as 1 or as high as 30. These ability scores and the ability modifiers derived from them are the basis for almost every d20 roll that a player makes on a character's or monster's behalf. Ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws are the three main kinds of d20 rolls, forming the core of the rules of the game. All three follow simple steps. 1. Roll the die and add the modifier. Roll a d20 and add the relevant modifier. This is typically the modifier derived from one of the six ability points, and it sometimes includes a proficiency bonus to reflect a character's particular skill. See Chapter 1 for details on each ability and how to determine its ability's modifier. 2. Add circumstantial bonuses and penalties. A class feature, a spell, a particular circumstance, or other effect might give a bonus or penalty to check. 3. Compare the total to a target number. The total equals, if the total equals or exceeds the target number, the ability check, attack roll, or saving throw is a success. Otherwise, it is a failure. The DM usually the one who determines the target numbers and tells the player whether or not their ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws succeed or fail. The target number for an ability check or saving throw is called a difficulty class, or DC. The target number for an attack roll is called an armor class, or AC. This simple rule governs the resolution of most tasks in D&D. Chapter 7, Using Ability Scores, provides more detailed rules for using the D20 in the game. Pardon me with the thing shaking. My dog is having a paddle. Dogs. <laughs> Advantage and Disadvantage. Sometimes an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw is modified by special situations called advantage and disadvantage. Advantage reflects the positive circumstances surrounding a d20 roll, while disadvantage reflects the opposite. When you have either advantage or disadvantage, you roll a second d20 when you make the roll. Using the higher of the two rolls when you have advantage, and the lower when you have disadvantage. For example, if you have a disadvantage and roll a 17 and a 5, you must use the 5. If you have advantage of, and you have those numbers, it will be the 17. For more detailed rules for advantage and disadvantage are presented in Chapter 7. I'm pretty sure it already said. Specific beats general. This book contains rules, especially in parts 2 and 3, that govern how the game plays. That said, many racial traits, class features, spells, magic items, monster abilities, and other game elements break the general rules in some way, creating an exception to how the rest of the game works. Remember this. If a specific rule contradicts a general rule, the specific rule wins. Exceptions to the rules are often minor. For instance, many adventurers won't have proficiency with longbows, but every wood elf does because it's a racial trait. That trait creates a minor exception in the game. 
Other examples of rule breaking are more conspicuous. For instance, an adventurer can't normally pass through walls, but some spells make that possible. Magic accounts for most of the major exceptions to the rules. Round down. There's one more general rule that you need to know at the outset. Whenever you divide a number in the game, round down if you end up with a fraction, even if the fraction is greater than one half. Or one half. Still round down. Adventures. The D&D &D game consists of a group of characters embarking on an adventure that the Dungeon Master presents to them. Each character brings particular capabilities to the adventure in the form of ability scores and skills, class features, racial traits, equipment, and magic items. Every character is different with various strengths and weaknesses, so the best party of adventurers is one with the characters complement each other and cover the weaknesses of their companions. The adventurers must cooperate to successfully complete their adventure. The adventure is the heart of the game, a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. An adventure might be created by the DM or purchased off the shelf, tweaked and modified to suit the DM's needs and desires. In either case, an adventurer feature an adventure features a fantastic setting whether it's an underground dungeon, a crumbling castle, a stretch of wilderness, or a bustling city. It features a wrist, rich cast of characters, and the adventurers created and played by the other players at the table, as well as non-player characters, NPCs. Those characters might be patrons, allies, enemies, hirelings, or just background extras in the adventure. Often, one of the NPCs is a villain whose agenda drives much of the adventurer's action. Over the course of their adventures, the characters are confronted by a variety of creatures, objects, and situations that they must be able to deal with in some way. Sometimes the adventurers and other creatures do their best to kill or capture each other in combat. At other times, the adventurers talk to another creature, or even magical object, with a goal in mind. And often, the adventurers spend time trying to solve a puzzle, bypass an obstacle, find something hidden, or unravel the current situation. Meanwhile, the adventurers explore the world making decisions about which way to travel and what they'll try to do next. Adventures vary in length and complexity. A short adventure might present only a few challenges and might take no more than one single game session to complete. A long adventure can involve hundreds of combats, interactions, and other challenges and take dozens of sessions to play through, stretching over weeks or months of real time. Usually, the end of an adventure is marked by the adventurers heading back to civilization to rest and enjoy the spoil of their labors. But that's not the end of the story. You think of an adventure as a single episode in a TV series, made up of multiple exciting scenes. A campaign is a whole series, a string of adventures, joined together with a consistent group of adventurers following the narrative from start to finish. Three Pillars of Adventure Adventurers can try to do anything their players can imagine, but it can be helpful to talk about their activities in three broad categories exploration, social interaction, and combat. Exploration includes both the adventurer's movement through the world and their interaction with objects and situations that require their attention. Exploration is a give and take of players describing what they want their characters to do and the DM telling the players what happens as a result. On a large scale, that might involve the characters spending a day crossing a rolling plain, or an hour making their way through caverns underground. On the smallest scale, it could mean one character pulling a lever in a dungeon room to see what happens. 
Social interaction. Features the adventurers talking to someone or something else. It might mean demanding that a captured scout reveal the secret entrance to the goblin lair, getting information from a rescued prisoner, pleading for mercy from an orc chieftain, or persuading a talkative magic mirror to show a distant location to the adventurers. The rules in part two, especially chapters seven and eight, support exploration and social interaction, as do many class features and personality traits in part one. Combat. The focus of chapter nine involves characters and other creatures swinging weapons, casting spells, maneuvering for position, and so on. All in the effort to defeat their opponents, whether that means killing every enemy, taking captives, or forcing a rout. Combat is the most structured element of a and d session, with creatures taking turns to make sure that everyone gets a chance to act. Even in the context of a pitched battle, there's still plenty of opportunity for adventurers to attempt wacky stunts like surfing down a flight of stairs on a shield, to examine the environment, perhaps by pulling a mysterious lever, and to interact with other creatures, including allies, enemies, and neutral parties. The wonders of magic. Few D&D adventures end without something magical happening. Whether helpful or harmful, magic appears frequently in the life of an adventurer, and it is the focus of part three. In the worlds of D&D, practitioners of magic are rare, set apart by the masses of people by their extraordinary talent. Common folk might see evidence of a magic, of magic on a regular basis, but it's usually minor. A fantastic monster with visibly answered prayer. I'm oh, sorry. A fantastic monster, visibly answered prayer. A wizard walking through the streets with animated shield guardian as a bodyguard. For adventurers, though, magic is key to survival. Without the healing magic of clerics and paladins, adventurers would quickly succumb to their wounds. Without the uplifting magical support of bards, clerics, and warriors, might yeah sorry of bards and clerics, warriors might be overwhelmed by powerful foes. Without the sheer magical power and versatility of wizards and druids, every threat would be magnified tenfold. Magic is also favored tool of villains. Many adventures are driven by the machinations of spellcasters who are hell-bent on using magic for some ill end. A cult leader seeks to awaken a god who slumbers beneath the sea. A hag kidnaps youths to magically drain them of their vigor. A mad wizard labors to invest an army of automata, automatons with phasmal of life. A dragon begins a mystical ritual to rise up as a god of destruction. These are just a few of the magical threats that the adventurers might face. With magic of their own, in the form of spells and magical items, the adventurers might prevail. And that's where I'm leaving the end of this video, and I will do part one, creating a character, in my next video. I hope that my tripping over my words was not too bad and you either liked it or got a laugh. Uh, thanks for joining me and hope you'll enjoy part two.